All right, it is time to begin. Hello, my name is Chanel Hasten. I am the Director of Outreach and Community Relations for the Alaka Alliance. Thank you for joining us this evening for sharing space with Sea Otters with our guests from Sea Otter Savvy. Uh, I'm going to do a little opening about the Alaka Alliance and who we are real quick, if you don't know uh, who we are. So hopefully you will by the end of this. Uh, and then I'll pass it off to Heather and Jenna. All right, so who is the Alaka Alliance? What are we? So we uh, were a concept created by David Hatch, who was a Siletz tribal member of the Coos, Sayusla, and Aleut descent. He initially was searching for a name for a dinghy he was building with his son, Peter, and found the word Alaka in a Chinook jargon dictionary, which means sea otter. And this led down the path of activism and to raise awareness to everyday Oregonians and scientists alike about the extirpation of sea otters from Oregon, their key ecological role and the possibility of their return. Um, so we were officially named a nonprofit in April of 2020. So as you can see, uh, there's a map of the various tribal um, organizations along the Oregon coast. And you can also see that there's so many different names for sea otter uh, from these different tribal nations. So they definitely were here many, many years ago, at least 10,000 years ago. Uh, so there's a very strong cultural connection to sea otters, sorry. I'm just getting over a cold, so I apologize for the coughing. Um, <clears throat> so, all right, moving on. I wanted to show, this is a recent photo in November of a lone sea otter off of the Oregon coast. And unfortunately, there's only two places you can see sea otters uh, that you're guaranteed to see them. Any guesses? You can use the chat if you want. One is the Oregon Coast Aquarium in Newport, and two is the Oregon Zoo in Portland. So we have zero native sea otters here on the Oregon coast. And they were once very plentiful many years ago uh, along the entire West Coast from Alaska to Mexico. But now there's a 900 mile gap from Northern California to Northern Washington where sea otters are nowhere to be found. So why is that a problem? So here, my friend Patrick Webster in Monterey Bay, this is a very healthy, plentiful kelp forest. And this is what it would look like if you had sea otters present. And that's some, you know, lots of great rockfish and bull kelp. But here in Oregon, without sea otters, you can see here that it's an urchin barren, which means there's urchins that are basically zombies eating everything in their path. So our kelp forests are being diminished, which is also happening in California as well. And yesterday, a really exciting news. It's like they knew we were gonna give a presentation tonight. <laughs> uh, there is a sea otter that was photographed uh, more on the Northern coast uh, in between Cannon Beach and Arch Cape uh, at Silver Point in Clatsop County. <laughs> taken by, these photos were taken by Molly Sultany, who is a bird watching and instead found this sea otter. Uh, and you can tell the difference because sea otters swim on their backs uh, and river otters swim on their stomachs. So this sea otter was seen swimming on its back for the most of the time and then diving down and coming up um, with food. And you can also tell a little bit by the whiskers in their face uh, that it's a sea otter. Some people asked us on social media about that. So if you're on the North Coast in between Cannon Beach and Arch Cape, keep your eyes out. And if you get any photos or videos, be sure to send it to us, please. So our mission is to restore a healthy population of sea otters here on the Oregon coast to help our marine ecosystem be more robust and resilient. And there's a photo of me scuba diving in October off the Port Orford, and you can see a hold fast that's been nibbled on by some sea urchins. We have a feasibility study. So is it feasible to reintroduce sea otters on the Oregon coast? Yes, it is. Uh, you can read it all on our website, alakalliance.org. We have 12 chapters by some of the top scientists in the field. So please read that. If you have any questions about exactly what we're doing, our website is a plethora of information. Uh, so it'd be very helpful for that. 
in saying that as well, we also have great resources on our Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. <coughs> Apologize for that. Hold on one second. And also you can join our email newsletter that we send out once a month called The Raft on our website as well. So finally, uh, we welcome Sea Otter Savvy's founder and director, Jenna Bental, and science communications director, Heather Barrett. <laughs> oh no, okay, I'm good. I'm You're almost, almost there, happy. you're almost there. <laughs> <laughs> to tell the story of the return of sea otters to human-occupied California coast and the challenges of balancing the needs of wildlife and people in a changing world. So off to you, Heather or Jenna, actually, right? She's first. Yeah, let me see. And also, sorry, I always forget. Uh, if you have any questions during out the presentation, please use the Q&A filter button <coughs> or use the chat if that's easier for you and I'll facilitate that at the end. Okay, I'm gonna mute myself now. <laughs> Is everybody seeing my um, full slide page? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Chanel and the Alaka Alliance for inviting me to speak today. And thanks to all of you for joining me here today as attendees. Um, as Chanel said, I'm the director of Sea Otter Savvy. We're a nonprofit organization with the mission to use outreach and education to foster community stewardship and reduce human caused disturbance to sea otters. We're working for the most part uh, to resolve conflict over space between sea otters and people. And that's something I'm gonna explain a lot more to you about here today. As I've grown with sea otter savvy over the last six years, I have learned a lot, uh, but I still don't know the answer to resolving this conflict. Um, I'm imparting some of what I have learned over the last six years as, as an example, a case study, a case study of a struggle to preserve, to preserve wildness in a world with an expanding human dominance. Central question, what kind of neighbors are we going to be to other species remains unanswered. And I'm speaking to you today from Moss Landing at the heart of Monterey Bay in California. And I'd like to acknowledge that we are located on the land of the Ohlone. Okay, slide. Come on. Here we go. There we go. I'd like to start with a definition. Urban wildlife is a term that has been coined to describe wildlife that has adapted their lifestyle to living in the concrete jungles of cities and suburban neighborhoods. Well, let's hope we never live to see the extreme habituation illustrated by this comic strip. I'll just read it for you. Uh, the deer says, I don't like to gossip, Vicky, but the raccoons were in your garage. And have you seen what the bears have done with their den? Tacky. Anywho, I gotta go pick up the kids from soccer practice. And she says, wildlife are getting way too urbanized. When we hear the term urban wildlife, what species comes to mind? So just think in your head um, what species you think of um, relating to that term, coyotes, raccoons, pigeons, but I bet you don't think about sea otters as urban wildlife. These symbols of the wild, rugged, inaccessible coasts of Alaska, Russia, or British Columbia, where this photo was taken. But for a considerable portion of their current California range, the Southern sea otter largely overlaps with human development, dense populations, and high rates of tourism. This photo was taken uh, in Elkhorn Slough, uh, very near where my office is located. They are literally surrounded with boats, recreational craft, commercial craft, buildings, agriculture, golf courses, highways, triathlons, regattas, drones, photographers, the list goes on. The difference between humans and all other life on this planet is that we can choose how to coexist in the world. We can choose what the definition of coexistence means. Sea otters are certainly forced to adapt to us. Their survival depends on it and they've been adapting to us for a long time. We will in turn, will we in turn adapt to them? 
in a way that respects their needs as they resume their place on the North American West Coast. So just a little bit about the two of us. Uh, I spent 13 years working as a sea otter biologist studying wild otters for the US Geological Survey, UC Santa Cruz, Monterey Bay Aquarium. I've spent thousands of hours watching sea otters in places like San Nicolas Island in Southern California, where I did my graduate research, to the more exotic and extremely remote Russian commander islands to right here on the central coast, where there's always an espresso less than five minutes away. All this time spent studying otters has resulted in a couple things relevant to my work with sea otter savvy. It's, it's left me with a fair amount of savvy when it comes to sea otters, and it's left me frustrated by how relentlessly they're disturbed by our recreational activities. And then Heather Barrett is our science communication director. Heather's interest in sea otter conservation and ecology developed through her undergraduate degree at UC Santa Cruz, an internship with the Monterey Bay Aquarium. You can see that that place is a thread that connects all of your hosts tonight. Um, and that's where I first met her. When, when, and then she conducted some graduate research at Moss Landing Marine Labs, where she collaborated with Sea Otter Savvy. As the science communication director, Heather refined science communication strategies, oversees creation and promotion of science-related materials, leads science related media relations and develop special projects for outreach. And she continues her research interests in human disturbance to sea otters and has the help from her assistant at the lower right corner, Logan, and my special assistant is at um, the little beagle with his tongue out in front of a nice raft of sea otters in Moss Landing. While I tracked wild tagged sea otters, um, I inevitably encountered disturbance. I would be filled with dread when pulling up to some sites, knowing that with, it was almost certain that I was gonna witness some kind of disturbance to a mom with a small pup or a female that I knew was recovering from just having reared and, and weaned a pup. It was difficult to witness and difficult to combat. And I confess, I, I did a lot of yelling in those days, and I'm pretty sure I scared some small children. Uh, this is a technique that I don't consider effective today, and we've completely abandoned that technique um, from, the, from the start with Sea Otter Savvy. But I do understand the frustration in a world where it can sometimes be a struggle to feel like you have any power to make a difference. Maybe there's not so much we can do to keep white sharks from biting sea otters, which is the number one cause of mortality of sea otters in California. Um, but the simple act of giving space to a sea otter is one thing we can do to make the world better, safer, and more pe peaceful place for them. Here are some components of this case study, characteristics of sea otters and some elements of how humans perceive them that are part of the coexistence equation. Sea otters are recovering, they're vulnerable, and they live in near shore habitat. Some of the human behavior elements, um, they see humans live close to where sea otters live. They perceive them as charismatic. And because uh, they are such a draw and are so beloved, they become profitable for some communities. Wherever they're recovering, sea otters are perceived as competitors for food and space. But keep in mind, when it comes to food, one is competing to meet their survival demands and the other is competing with a few exceptions in the case of subsistence foragers for a livelihood. This topic is an hour long talk on its own and it's covered well and thoroughly by the Alok Alliance in their uh, webinar series. Since the Outer Savvy focuses more on conflict over space, primarily in largely urbanized California, that is what we are going to emphasize today. The solutions to conflict over food employ some overlapping principles, but are more complex. Conflict over food tends to center around a specialized user group. Um, shell fisheries and conflict over space can pertain to anyone living at or visiting the Central California coast. Characteristics of sea otters. 
Sea otters once ranged continuously through the entire North Pacific Rim from Northern Japan through the Russian Far East, um, the Bear, Russian Bering Island, where I spent a couple of summers uh, working in the field, uh, Alaska, Canada, and down the US West Coast into Baja. They were reduced to scattered remnant colonies you see here in these uh, red circles by the maritime fur trade and have recovered with variable success portions of their historic range. You can see that in the pink. The story of the near extinction of sea otters has its origin in the shipwreck of one of the ships of the Bering Expedition in 1741. The shipwreck um, in 1741 and stellar sea cow, also a denizen of the Commander Islands in Russia, was declared extinct by 1768. So within 27 years of its discovery by the shipwrecked Europeans, the slow moving and easily caught mammal was hunted into extinction for its meat, fat, and hide. And all that remains now are bones on the shore. Sea otters didn't fare much better as a result of this Bering expedition and 1741 ushered in the heyday of the maritime trade and sea otter pelts hunted relentlessly by maritime fur traders for their luxurious fur, they were reduced in number to just a few thousand worldwide by the end of the 19th century and received full protection along with the Northern Fur Seals under the International Fur Seal Treaty of 1911. If you're interested in learning more about this story, I highly recommend Where the Sea Breaks Its Back by Corey Ford, which is a great account of the shipwreck uh, and the Bering Expedition. And you can also read Georg Steller, uh, the Steller, who's lended his name to so many species, his log of the expedition, and he was also among the shipwrecked. It's a fascinating story. By the time the Marine Mammal Protection Act was enacted in 1972, the California population had grown from as few as 50 to more than 1,000 individuals, an average annual growth rate of about 5%, and had recolonized more than 200 miles, 370 kilometers of the California coast. Today, that ranges principally along the central coast from Pigeon Point north to Santa Cruz, um, north of Santa Cruz to Point Conception, which is that elbow of California that sticks up just before you get to Southern California, and now includes San Nicolas Island and the Channel Islands. Um, so the population range-wide has been hovering around 3,000 um, with stalled expansion to the north and south, which is a topic I won't have time to cover today, but is a fascinating story in and of itself. So on the left here, what you see is a heat map with the reddest areas indicating the highest sea otter densities. Range center where densities are highest is typically, typically considered to be between Moss Landing, where our office is located, and Morro Bay. If we carry this range map over, we can see that the southern sea otter has recovered only a small portion of its pre-fur trade California range, all expanding from this origin point off the coast of Big Sur. In the huge state of California, I am able to drive from one end of their range to the other in just a handful of hours. Southern sea otters were listed as threatened in 1977 under the Endangered Species Act, primarily uh, due to reduced range and population size, vulnerability to oil spills and oil spill risk from uh, coaster tanker traffic. As a consequence of their threatened status, Southern sea otters are also recognized as depleted under the Marine Mammal Protection Act and under state law, Southern sea otters are fully protected mammals. In their two, 2015 five-year report on the Southern sea otter, the US Fish and Wildlife Service identified human caused disturbance as an additional threat. Sea otters among marine mammals are have some unique characteristics that make them especially vulnerable to the effects of disturbance. There's a term used in animal physiology, and maybe you can think about what this might mean, which describes species as capital spenders or savers. In the two photos shown here, top and bottom, can you guess which is the spender and which is the saver? How are they saving and what are they spending? And remember that range center I indicated on the map a few slides ago is not unusual to see very thin sea otters like this female here at the center of the California range. 
if you happen to be in California and you go out otter spotting, keep an eye out as they dive for a visible spine and pelvis. It's pretty typical to see, especially among female otters here where food, there's a lot of competition for a finite um, amount of food. Sea otters have the highest mass specific metabolic rate of any marine mammal. They do not store fat as blubber as other marine mammal species do. And they're a more recent addition to the marine environment. They do not have the same length of evolution timeline as cetaceans and pinnipeds. So they're not as, as um, well adapted to the marine environment as those other marine mammals. Sea, sea otters rely on their dense fur and metabolic rate for maintaining their internal body temperature. Their fur is the densest of any animal, of any mammal, up to a million hairs per square inch. And they have two types of hair. They have, uh, um, they have exterior hair that helps the water to flow off of their coat. And they have under fur that is covered with little barbs that help it lock together and form an air pocket that keeps the cold air from the cold water from ever touching their skin. So the main takeaway is that sea otters are in a constant struggle to maintain body temperature in a cold environment. They are constantly burning through energy and they're inefficient at laying on fat as a way to store energy. And they are very dependent on the um, well-groomed quality of their coat. The stack figures at right from uh, our results from long-term data collection by Sea Otter Savvy. This is a 12 hour typical day and there's three things shown on these different graphs. So the top graph with the red and the blue lines, that's on the y-axis or the vertical axis is the proportion of time that otters are active. And this is a typical day that has been generated by our model as an estimate based on all of the last six years of data that we've collected to come up with a standard activity budget for sea otters with and without what we call stimuli. And stimuli can be anything that might provoke a behavior change in a sea otter, but uh, typically it's gonna be a marine recreation craft, especially kayaks. So in the red, you can see um, a typical estimated activity budget for a sea otter it goes up and down throughout the day. And there's sort of a low activity period in the middle of the day when most otters tend to be resting. And those blue spikes are just spikes in activity when stimuli happen to be present. If you go down to the next figure, that just shows what the energetic cost instantaneously is for that, for that otter for each of those spikes over the baseline activity level. And then the bottom figure just shows you how that accumulates over time throughout the day. So it, the instantaneous happens quickly, but it adds up and adds up. And by the end of the day, they're at, an, they may be at an energetic deficit. And at the very least, they have to eat more food to make up for that amount of energy lost. There is only one way that energy comes in, and that is in the form of prey for which they must expend energy um, foraging. Below are all activities that are necessary for survival, grooming, pup care, swimming between resting and foraging areas. And if you add on top of that, oh, and then of course they need recuperative rest, like we all need in order to uh, reset your body systems, to digest prey, to generate energy, and, and to just conserve energy. If you add on top of that, avoidance of disturbance, usually swimming and diving, the most energetically expensive behaviors of sea otters, the luxury tax of the sea otter's income, it hurts and it's unnecessary. It's like when you're making ends meet paycheck to paycheck and your car breaks down, requiring funds that you may not have been able to save up for. And that puts you at a deficit. Human perspective. Characteristics of sea otters that place them in proximity to humans. They live near shore, they're shallow divers, they favor habitats where humans live, work, forage, and play. They are proximate to human development and accessible. There are a number of places throughout the Southern Sea Otters range where important sea otter habitat and favored marine recreational op opportunities, especially those for novices, beginners, overlap. Interactions between otters and humans are inevitable. 
their accessibility is compounded by what I refer to as the sea otter's publicity problem. These animals are undeniably charismatic in their appearance and behavior. I don't like to use the, what I call the C word, C-U-T-E. Uh, while they certainly have their detractors, those numbers are vastly overwhelmed by their fans and travelers to the central coast are often specific, specifically seeking out sea otter viewing opportunities. And unfortunately, some are seeking interactions or images to replicate what they've seen on social media. Hand in hand with their charisma is the benefit to tourism related businesses that capitalize on their accessibility. Sea otters are demonstrably money makers for communities and their recovery throughout their global range has prompted investigation of their economic, not to mention their ecological impact on communities. There's a flip side to everything though, and we're currently investigating the impact of increased numbers of recreational users in a bounded habitat like Elkhorn Slough on the frequency of sea otter disturbance. So numbers in outdoor areas spiked. So I'm gonna just play this little video for you. This is a time-lapse video uh, that started right uh, during the first weeks of the COVID-19 lockdown and then the transition to the Labor Day, um, Memorial Day of that um, same summer. So the number spiked as people turned to outdoor activities during COVID-19 and Elkhorn Slough was no exception. This is a study in progress by Sea Otter Savvy. So stay tuned until this time next year uh, for some results. So you can see how quiet, and then this is Labor Day weekend. And you might be able to see the little raft of sea otters uh, kind of upper right on the screen. There's just one left now. This is pretty much continuous throughout the day, although there are peak hours. So here's the formula, charisma plus accessibility plus profitability plus, and I think this is a pretty important factor, the social media selfie culture or the desire to get the most likes on your photos is a recipe for disturbance. People wanna to get too close and we often see that cell phone sticking out in front of them. In order to get a good cell phone picture or video of sea otters, you have to get too close. You can see the sea otters starting to look here. Here's somebody trying to get a selfie. All the sea otters are looking. And people rarely understand that their one moment is not the only moment the only experience with a kayaker that those otters will have. And the average number of times that a disturbance occurs on the coast through across all of our study sites is six. And that's the average number. So that means some sites have more. Now I'm gonna step onto my soapbox box for a minute. Uh, photos of wildlife tell stories. Oops. An image or a hashtag search on just about any platform reveals the persistent popularity of depictions of sea otters reacting to the human, the person behind the lens. The eye contact portrait has long been a gold standard of wildlife photography, and we see the impact of that manifested in the behavior of photographers seeking otter photos. We witness that every day in the field. It's up to us to decide what story do we wanna support? a story that celebrates the sea otter in its world or the repeated focus on their reaction or their engagement with a human. I encourage all of you to join us in turning eye contact portraits on their head. Favor photos that feature sea otters themselves over their reaction to us. And what you just saw was my scroll of shame. So I have a little um, special folder where I keep Instagram images that portray um, sea otters looking at or reacting to the photographer and you can see that they're extremely common if you go into your instagram or even onto your google search now and search sea otter you will see photo after photo just like these and as we're recording disturbance data this is what we we see these happening day after day so let's bring all of these things together sea otters are recovering species they're charismatic, they're accessible, 
They're vulnerable. They're especially vulnerable among all marine mammals. And the human behavior factor is very difficult to control. So in the past, wildlife issues like wildlife human conflict issues were often resolved by wildlife management. And there's an increasing awareness that it really is a human behavior issue that we have to address. So let's bring back this question and remind ourselves of our luxury of choice. The difference between humans and all other life on this planet is we can choose how to coexist in the world. Animals always have to adapt to us. Maybe it's time we make an effort to adapt to them. And now I'm going to introduce you to the amazing Heather Barrett to finish up. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Jenna. What an excellent first start to this. We are doing our transition. Let's see if I can do that. Thanks, Chanel, for, set, for putting those links in the chat. Yes, thank you. Welcome. And transition. <laughs> Thanks, Jenna. Um, yeah, so you just listened to Jenna really discuss the recipe of how disturbance comes about. And so now at the end of this, we really wanna go back to that concept of coexistence and sort of wrap up with that. And I think we both agree that awareness is the first. It's not the only, but it is one of the first steps towards coexistence. And awareness can include a lot of different things, okay? So awareness can be the vulnerability of sea otters, their natural history, the history of a recovering species, Awareness of human disturbance. What does it look like? What cost does it have to sea otters? Jenna mentioned that. What can it, we do to prevent it? And awareness of one's own environmental identity. And I'm gonna to touch more on that in an upcoming slide. Um, but we believe awareness is so important that we have an entire week that is dedicated to it. We have Sea Otter Awareness Week and it's the last week of September every year. I hope you guys tune in and join us um, for this year's. We already have some great ideas planned. Now, Sea Otter Savvy requires that our tool for bringing awareness, which is our outreach, is founded in science. Um, so we not only keep up with the most up-to-date research, but we conduct our own um, to better understand disturbance and track the trends. And our data collection sessions, we call them scan sessions, are conducted by our volunteers, students, I was a student, <laughs> and interns of Sea Otter Savvy program at sites throughout the Central Coast. And Sea Otter began collecting data in 2015 and scans are done through all the seasons and throughout the week. So this is a dedicated group of people. Now, one of the objectives of our research and a big part of my thesis was to investigate how distance and location influence the impact of disturbance. Now, the figure you're looking at is illustrating the concept that you, you are the stimuli, and in this case, you're a kayaker, you're getting closer and closer, and there is a gradient of behavior change for the sea otter, okay? So there are potential disturbance thresholds and zones. Now on the y-axis, that's the relative effect on activity state for the sea otter, and it's the probability or the likelihood that a sea otter will be disturbed, and the x-axis is that stimuli or kayak distance from the sea otter in meters. And due to sea otter's impressed, sea otter savvy's impressive data set, that includes multiple sites. We were able to break this down by location, as well as show the averages across the sites, which is what you see in black, the dotted line. So as that kayak gets closer and closer, we can see that the potential for disturbance increases exponentially. So that sea otter in starts to become alert and then can dive down. And we can isolate these inflection points, right? Or thresholds to help generate graphics for outreach purposes. So for example, this from our distance results that we just looked at, we were able to create infographics like this that are distributed to businesses and partners. And they're a tool to increase awareness and assist marine recreation businesses with customer orientation. So especially when you pair this with verbal orientation, if someone's standing in front of you and they're talking, having a graphic like this can really convey information to those who may have previously been completely unaware of their potential impact of taking that selfie too close to that sea otter. And the hope is that it will result in behavior change from those recreating in those areas. Oh, sorry, my son just returned home. So if you hear him in the background, that's who that is. Um, so <laughs> Logan's returned. For many people, having empathy is an essential component for their behavior change too, right? So it's one thing to give them information, but to really change behavior, they have to really want to. Um, and so in many cases, this idea can turn into anthropomorphism. And that's basically when you attribute human qualities to a non-human animal, 
And this is definitely a slippery slope. We don't want people to assume sea otter behaviors are just like ours. As an average person, they may not understand or they can misrepresent behaviors that they're witnessing of wild sea otters. But I do personally believe that it is possible to have empathy without anthropomorphism. Um, so rather we can acknowledge that mammals share similarities during the daily struggles such as motherhood and exhaustion. <laughs> and with empathy comes better understanding and more willingness to learn that makes you change your behavior. So, and with empathy comes respect. So as a society, we generally respect our neighbors and we see them as part of our community. And so Jenna brought up that question, are sea otters our neighbors? Um, they are part of our ecosystem if we live on the coast. So are they community members? Now, the dictionary defines a community as a unified body of individuals. So if we take a moment and really consider that, you know, what are some of the ways that we are unified with sea otters? You know, I think we are in those areas. Sea otters are part of our community. They're working hard, making a living along the California Central Coast. And under that umbrella, they are deserving of our care, the consideration and stewardship as any of our neighbors would be. So now I'm not gonna to touch on a little bit how we value sea otters and, and how you place value, whether it be monetarily, culturally, ecologically. Um, if we go to the ecological aspect, sea otters are considered a keystone species. And that just means they have a really big impact on the surrounding ecological community that's disproportionate to how many sea otters may be there. Um, and this term comes from architecture. So it's the center stone that you see there in red, and it's putting pressure on the supporting stones. So once that keystone is removed, the remaining stones fall, and it's giving the analogy that the ecological community is altered. So those interactions between those species may completely disappear, or they could just be altered and changed. Um, I recommend uh, watching the video, Some Animals Are More Equal Than Others on YouTube, and I believe um, that link will be shared with you guys. But if you want to learn more about that concept, that's a great video to watch. Now, I want to read off this quote. This is from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Southern Sea Otter Recovery Coordinator Lillian Carswell, who is probably one of the most articulate persons <laughs> I've ever met. But this quote stands so strong with what we've been discussing. With the near extinction of sea otters during the fur trade, our coastal ecosystems were radically downgraded and simplified. The organisms sea otters had evolved alongside suddenly lost the main predator that kept them in check. Subsequent generations of Californians didn't know anything else, but as sea otters reclaim their historic range, I expect we will continue to discover far reaching ecological effects that we hadn't anticipated. The truth is, we don't even really know what we're missing. And that last point is just so strong because the truth is, we don't. We're constantly trying to understand more and more. So at this point, you guys have just digested a lot of information and pondered definitely some deep questions, but I'm going to add some more to that mix. Um, if you are living coastally on the Pacific side, you know, maybe you're wondering, were there sea otters in my community? Should there be? Could there be? Um, now, I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area, and I did look out and always wonder, man, I wish we could have sea otters back here. And sea otters were in Northern California. They were in San Francisco Bay, all the way up through Oregon, all the way along that coast. I want you to think back to that historic range map that Jenna showed earlier. And we are still missing sea otters in all these regions. So those sea otters have made great strides in recovery, there is still a really large gap to close. And these ecological communities have been missing a keystone for a really long time. Now there's been research done by Dr. Brent Hughes and Dr. Tim Tinker using population modeling. And they revealed that if they return to San Francisco Bay specifically, it could potentially more than double the current Southern Seattle population. And then there's long-term studies at Elkhorn Slough where sea otters from the Monterey Bay Aquarium surrogacy program were reintroduced into the estuary with huge success. And we know that bays, sloughs, estuaries make per perfect sea otter habitat. And here you can see this image. This is a female sea otter resting on the bank of pickleweed. Um, so sea otters were here, and although they are ecologically important, they have a cultural significance to many Pacific and indigenous communities, and sea otters and humans have had a long history, long before the European and Russian fur trade, and current conservation efforts are really looking into the next step, and that may include the potential for reintroduction of sea otters into Northern California as well to hopefully restore what many communities have been missing. But to get where we need to go, we really need to consider how do we all fit into that picture. So I'd like to touch on that term environmental identity. And that's really just how one views oneself in relation to the natural world. And this is really based on personal history, emotional attachment, similarity, that empathy that you've built. 
Um, and this is a question from our Sea Otter uh, stakeholder survey, and it's listing options of how you may personally depend on coastal resources. And it's giving you the chance to really consider how do you fit into this picture and what do you value? Is it cultural? Is it just the fact that existence value, um, enjoyment? There's ways to add more with the other. But we also wanted to make sure that we're allowing for self-identification. Right? There are many types of stakeholders and we want individuals to choose for themselves how they prefer to be identified. And this is not an exhaustive or mutually exclusive list, which is I think different than past methods, right? So truth is fisheries, for example, it's a really overarching category, but there are so many different types of fisheries, commercial, recreational, fin fish, shellfish, aquaculture. And so we feel it's really important that each individual have the chance to recognize, first of all, you need to recognize yourself as a stakeholder, then you need to identify yourself as such, and then have the opportunity to share your thoughts, values, and your concerns um, regarding the conversation around potential sea otter reintroduction. Because ultimately the return of sea otters to these historical areas, it starts with you. So here's my pitch. <laughs> Your voice matters. You are a sea otter stakeholder, whether you are a student, a business owner, you work in tech, fisheries, um, or just enjoy knowing that sea otters exist. You are part of this conversation. Um, we want to hear from you, even if you don't necessarily live coastally. Now, Sea Otter Savvy's We Were Here Sea Otter program is dedicated to educating communities and stakeholders that are missing sea otters. And again, sea otters are ecologically, but they're culturally significant. And there's an increasing discussion regarding range expansion, possible reintroduction, but to move forward, government agencies, sea otter research community, we all need to gauge public stakeholder opinions and understand the concerns and the issues. And we need to start a strong foundation of awareness if we're ever gonna reach coexistence in these new areas. So if you're wondering what you can do, please take the stakeholder survey and share with others. The link to the We Were Here Sea Otter page and the survey will be shared to you um, in the chat. And so as I'm wrapping up, we really want the main takeaway to be that, you know, setting the stage for coexistence in areas without sea otters, as well as fostering a coexistence in areas that already have sea otters, it begins with your awareness and behavior change. So you can be a role model. Um, and people are gonna do what they're gonna do. Um, our job is to change what they want to do. And that's really, really difficult. And past ways to really, how they were reducing wildlife disturbance was more centered on managing the wildlife, fence them in, fence them out, get rid of them. Um, but new strategies are focusing on our behavior, or human behavior to improve the management of human wildlife interactions. Um, but again, changing human behavior, it's hard. And it really requires the understanding of psychology, communication, interpretation. And this is the reasons why research uh, outreach and education are so critical for setting a strong foundation. Now, this guided kayak group that you're seeing in this photo represents an excellent role model. Okay, and this is demonstrating that businesses can be role models as well. And there are many businesses that live alongside sea otters in Central California already. And Sea Otter Savvy has a certification process for businesses with our Community Active Wildlife Stewards Program. And we utilize social marketing as a technique. So we're applying marketing principles to create value in order to influence target audience behaviors that benefit the community as a whole. And so if we break that down, the social marketing concept really leads with the idea that benefits to a business, okay, and benefits to wildlife benefits everyone. And another form of community engagement and creating a role model is community science programs. And community science is involving the communities and public and research increases awareness and it also increases empathy. So at Sea Otter Savvy, our community science team members, they receive training from sea otter biologists, they make observations, they collect data that is used to inform our understanding of human disturbance to sea otters. They, that helps us track trends, engage the effectiveness of the tactics that we're using. And my thesis and my research would not exist without the dedication of our incredible community science team. Um, they in turn share their knowledge and experience with others in the community and they themselves then become role models. So if you're sitting there wondering, okay, what can I do? This, here's a few different things. And this list is inspired from Gandhi. First is to learn, educate yourself. Once you know more, you can do more. Expand your empathy. With empathy, there's respect. Expand your community, share with others what you're learning, seek others out in that community, find your environmental identity, find your passion and be the change. 
share your voice, change your behavior, become active. So these are just some of the things that you can maybe think about, how can I make a difference? And the beauty is that coexistence is possible. It is within the power of each of us to demonstrate respect for wildlife and give them space and leave them no trace of our presence behind. So Jenna asked earlier, what kind of neighbors are we going to be? <laughs> well, hopefully, as more and more people become in tune with their environmental identity and are willing to recognize that their behavior is what can make a difference, we can reach the point of coexistence for areas that are lucky to already have sea otters as neighbors. And hopefully we can set the stage and create a strong foundation of awareness for the areas that may one day observe sea otters again as neighbors. So to end, we really wanna emphasize that this all started not very long ago and it came out of passion and community. So as spring of 2014, there was a working group composed of members from the California Southern Sea Otter Research Alliance. And it was formed to address the issue of marine recreation and sea otter disturbance, which was becoming a really apparent issue. And Sea Otter Savvy is a product of that working group. And most of the people um, continue to serve as program advisors. And it was conceived as a way to incorporate outreach techniques with a system of good stewardship recognition as a way to recruit the community as active participants in creating a new social norm for responsible behavior around wildlife. So this is just us saying thank you so much, Alaka, for having us um, speak with you today and share information. And if you are interested to learn more about Sea Otter Savvy and all of our different programs, definitely visit seaottersavvy.org and follow us. We are active on social media. Um, so definitely follow us for more information. And Thank you to our advisors, advisors, project partners, and research affiliates. And I will hand it back over to Chanel. Thanks, Heather and Jenna. That was amazing. I think I shared all of the links um, for everyone to learn more. So we do have a couple questions. So um, if you have any, please use the Q&A feature and put them in there. Awesome. Okay. Uh, Jenna, I saw you already answered one, but maybe you can just say it out loud. Uh, is Elkhorn Slough reaching its carrying capacity for sea otters, Art asked? Yeah, so Elkhorn Slough, um, for those who don't know, is a, is a wetlands estuary that extends um, inland from Moss Landing, which is at the heart of Monterey Bay. It's also the heart of Sea Otter Savvies, where our office is based. Um, and uh, it's been studied for quite a number of years. It's pretty unusual because it is the first example of a wetlands estuary system being recolonized by sea otters, even though we have a lot of information, historic information saying that they did utilize uh, wetlands in the past. And you can read about that on the We Were Here page, by the way. Um, and so it's been studied quite thoroughly uh, there was a project with some tagged otters that happened, I believe, back in 2013 or so. Um, and as that project wrapped up, it was it was clear that that um, population was at or near carrying capacity. And since then, it's been kind of hovering right around that uh, pretty steady numbers. Um, in the slough, there was a bachelor raft of males that was in Moss Landing Harbor that dispersed in 2019 for unknown reasons. Um, but this, the number within the slough, the estuary itself has remained pretty stable. If on any given day, if you go out and watch otters out there, it's, it's really amazing that for decades they've been foraging there and for decades you can still go out and see them come up with a gigantic gaper clam. Um, so the pot prey population is extraordinarily resilient. But that being said, most otters that I see on a day-to-day -day basis, when they dive down, which is especially when I get a look at their body condition, I can see um, exposed um, pelvis and spine and ribs. So they're, they're, that, that's not anything particularly abnormal for a carrying capacity population because they're really struggling to meet that daily energetic balance in competition with all the other otters that are also trying to do the same thing. So that's a very clear body condition. The amount of time spent foraging and patterns of prey selection are three really strong indices of um, carrying capacity. And for sure, um, the body condition is, is uh, looking pretty dire for them. So at some point, maybe they'll move on and expand to another area or who knows what will happen, but we expect that that prey availability will crash at some point. Thank you. 
All right. Martha asked, how do you approach someone who is being too intrusive to any wildlife? Do you have any ideas? <laughs> <laughs> it's, so it's really, really hard. Mm -hmm. um, so we take a deep we, breath. <laughs> so, so I mentioned that when I was a biologist, my approach was yelling. Um, and now I have, I have much more. I also, while I encourage people to have empathy for sea otters, I try to have empathy for humans. And I go kayaking in the slough a lot. And I know there are some factors to consider um, when people are making, you know, approaching too closely. And, and so I try to have some empathy. I try to be kind and, um, and go in with the assumption that they don't know. Uh, they haven't received the information or they, it ha they haven't received it. I do know if they're renting that they have received the information. So that makes it a little bit tougher. Um, but I, I try to be kind and, and gentle and in an educational mode. Um, I will say that when you're confronting somebody in the moment, I, I don't know, I'm making up a statistic right now, but I would say 80% of the time they react defensively. So it doesn't matter if I come in with the most generous spirit uh, of education and, and understanding, um, they, they are maybe embarrassed about what they're doing. I don't, I don't really know. So it's hard. Um, and really our goal is to, to get information to every person that's on the water before they get on the water. And um, that's a lot easier when we're working through the recreational shops and it's a lot harder when it's just individuals that are, that are going out. So it's a challenge. And if you have any ideas, hey, you know, we're, we're open. Great. So Jenna, I know you're in Morro Bay right now. Um, so as they return there, what's been the attitude of the community? This is a really interesting story. I'm gonna try not to ramble too long, but back when I was um, working as a biologist, my first sea otter biologist job, um, we were tracking uh, wild otters. Actually, it was for Tim Tinker's doctoral thesis. Nice. He was just a little baby, baby Tinker um, <laughs> grad student. Um, and we had otters that would come down to Morro Bay. So some males do this split home range thing where they, are territorial on site with females and then they move to another spot to kind of take a little vacay from, from being territorial. And one of those spots was Morro Bay. And when we came to Morro Bay, this would have been in the early 2000s. Um, we did not use any insignia. We did not tell anyone what we were doing. We hid our equipment for fear of reprisal from the fishing community. And um, the, the, the leadership of the city of Morro Bay actually did a, an anti Seattle Awareness Week press release <laughs> um, at the time, but it is completely flipped uh, over now. And so the city of Morro Bay embraces sea otters and the tourism dollars that they bring. And the fishery community, you know, there's still some um, pretty hardcore folks, but I feel like they're quieter and fewer um and but generations I think that helps too. generations I didn't want to say it I don't want to say it but generations yeah <laughs> so and younger generations <laughs> coming in um for sure just want embrace the whole ecosystem approach so um right now it's a great environment and people are very um uh very keen to embrace sea otters for the most part Super. Sally asks, as sea temperatures change and climate change affects near shore habitats, might that be an opportunity for expanding the sea otter range northward? Well, I mean, the sea otters, so the sea otters existed northward um, prior to the fur trade. So the range was continuous from uh, mid Baja all the way around the Pacific Rim to Japan. Um, so they existed within the ocean conditions of that time of the whatever millions of years, three, 3.5 million years, whatever, before humans got, got into the mix. Um, so I don't think, 
if anything, I suspect it's it's a barrier because their prey availability is changing. Kelp canopy, kelp canopy is super sensitive to um, changes in ocean temperature, and uh, some of their prey species are sensitive. The the white sharks are moving further north. White sharks are also very temperature, ocean temperature dependent, and the increase in sea otter mortality um, due to white shark bites is has dramatically increased since I first started working with sea otters back in the early 2000s. So I don't, it's hard to know how this is all gonna play out, right? I mean, it's, it's an experiment in progress and who knows, but at this point, I think changing temperatures, there's a, it's at least gonna create a barrier in a time lag scenario. And there may be adaptation into the future and, and who knows, but I don't think it's going to help them. Uh, maybe a more positive note. Lauren asks, are you back in the schools giving presentations again? And can you talk a little bit about Michelle and your consultation services and how that is going? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, so we are trying to get back into schools. We're sort of, we, we sort of hit a roadblock with that as so many did with COVID-19 and we lost a lot of our volunteer team that was going out into schools. We're really trying to focus more on bringing the students out into the world of sea otters this year. And one of the things that struck me when we were going out into schools is that we would, um, we would we'd always start with a question, how many of you have seen a sea otter? And then the hands go up and, and it's very few. And then how many of you have been to the, the beach? And we've been in a community that was just a few miles from the beach and, and one or two hands would go up. And so, um, I talked about, Heather and I both talked about this concept of environmental identity, and we really want to focus on bringing these kids that are in the communities with sea otters out and, in, and to experience them so that they can not develop the, the environmental identity we want them to have, but to find what their environmental identity is for them, because that's going to be the most enduring and powerful. So we're really trying to bring kids out on kayak trips into the field where they can do actual science in the field and see real sea otters. And that's really our focus right now. Um, and we do, have, just to make a plug, we do have a consulting service. So there are three people on our consulting team, my, me, um, Heather and Michelle Stedler, who has 30 plus years of experience and is an iconic sea otter biologist um, in California and throughout the range. And we do consult for things like um, film. So we actually just started a project with a Japanese film company. Oh, there'll be a Netflix documentary coming out in April. That's the, our great American national parks that we consulted on. So don't miss that. There's some amazing sea otter footage in it. Really, really will knock your socks off. And it's sea otter savvy approved, which is rare. Um, so yeah, we do have a consulting service and you can check out our webpage um, if, if you wanna make recommendations um, for that. So yeah. Super. Can't wait to see that on Netflix. Um, would proposed offshore wind turbines affect sea otter habitats or does the pros outweigh the cons? As an anonymous person. I have to say I'm not educated enough on wind turbine. I don't know how far shore off, how far offshore they are. Um, sea otters are a nearshore species and they're limited by depth. So they are not great divers. They're not elephant seals. They typically we consider the 40 meter bathymetry line the range of sea otters um, and very few of them are going to be diving to 40 meters um, so i would i would want want to know how far offshore those were before i worry about an impact to them um, i i doubt that it would be as risky to them as an oil spill so one spill from an oil rig um, given the prevailing currents along the california coast could wipe out I think Prince William Sound, the Exxon Valdez spill wiped out about as many sea otters as exist in all of California right now. So um, an oil spill would be devastating and, and I, I can't really speak to wind turbines. Heather, do you have any? 
I am not familiar with wind turbines either, but I, I agree. I think that it, if we had more information, we could give better answers, but ultimately it depth and how far off it would be, would be questioning. Okay, Leah asks, are you seeing issues with random poaching or violence towards sea otters? We see very little of that uh, in California. Um, it does happen occasionally and there's always a big kerfuffle about it. So it's very difficult for us to get um, or for, for enforcement to respond to disturbance or harassment issues um, because they're spread really, really thin across a huge um, range of uh, territory. And, but um, if there is some extreme case of otters getting shot, um, it, it definitely happens. It's shocking, but it happens. We had a we had an otter pup shot at. I think it was shot at, but not shot because it was being too noisy. No. Yeah. So it does happen, but it's very very rare, and the penalty is swift and and hefty if they can identify the the perpetrator. But and they do have a forensic team that that got, really looks into those things. So for it's fortunate fortunately rare um for that to happen okay claire asks and getting on more positive notes <laughs> have you worked with chambers of commerce uh county boards of commissioners city councils to get your messages out yeah we so our big central task is to engage communities so that my role becomes non-essential in the future and so, you know, they just sort of take over the stewardship for, for the wildlife in their communities. Um, I'm actually on the Moss Landing Chamber of Commerce, so I can direct that pretty, pretty uh, heftily. Most of the, the, the communities that we work with recognize that profitability of sea otters and they really embrace, embrace it. And it just, it, it, it just varies in terms of how much, um, work they're willing to do on behalf of that and so that's the part that i'm still trying to figure out is to it's easy to get them to to, to say they're in favor and less easy to get them to actually do the work that needs to be done um art mentioned isn't there a huge increase in elephant seals providing food for white sharks down in california there's my baby <laughs> Um, so the elephant seals and sea lions, uh, pinnipeds along the California coast certainly provide food for white sharks. Um, the, the problem is that the rate at the range ends, um, there's, there's rookeries for, for pinnipeds, both elephant seals and sea lions at the range ends where otters are especially hard hit by white sharks. And the problem is mistaken identity. So we think and shark biologists think that there's just an, an increase or they have seen an increase in these juvenile, this juvenile age class of white sharks in further and further north as ocean temperatures change. And these younger sharks are transitioning. I call them stupid, but I mean, they're not stupid. They're just figuring it out. <laughs> but they're transitioning from a fish diet to a marine mammal diet. And the way that a shark decides whether something is edible or not is by biting it. So if you have a, a, a seal-like shape on the surface of the water, a shark comes up from underneath that and bites and then gets a mouthful of fur. And remember, they don't lay on that blubber layer, so it probably tastes pretty nasty, not even worth their digestion. Uh, it's too late for the sea otter. You know, they're, they're done for, so they rarely, rarely survive those. So actually the increase in pinnipeds probably creates more of a threat to sea otters because it increases the number of white sharks and the probability of a bite. Yeah, and that's what the sea otter I showed in the first slide that was here in November, he washed ashore with puncture wounds, most likely from a juvenile shark bite, investigative bite. Uh, and when you get a mouthful of hair, no blubber, you didn't look out on that meal. Yeah. Um, so, all right, we have a couple more questions. Thanks for staying on a little past seven o'clock your time. 
Um, let's see, how sensitive do the otters appear to be to noise only rather than noise plus movement? Example, loud boat far away starting its engine versus quieter boat moving nearby. That's a great question. So we have noted in our data, so we do note two things. We note um, the presence of noise, just a general noise like a motorcycle starting up or a loudspeaker or something like that. But we also note um, when uh, kayakers are noisy. And I can definitely say um, that if you're noisy, you're more likely to, if you're yelling, you have a group of young girls that are all, I shouldn't say girls, young people that are all really loud in their group, um, that's more likely to cause a disturbance. So anything unexpected. So, you know, a backfire or something that's just not part of their um, day-to-day -day existence, they haven't become habituated to it can cause a disturbance. So definitely noise. We do think, so we have a, we also have a drone um, study in progress in collaboration with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and California Department of Fish and Wildlife um, where we're looking at the impact of drones on sea otter behavior and the noise really seems to be the factor that causes them to become aware of the drones. So they don't have great hearing, but they certainly are sensitive to um, sounds. Fireworks, fireworks. We do have great data on um, uh, it from Morro Bay on, on the raft of sea otters and all the other wildlife in Morro Bay basically evaporating when the fireworks <laughs> went off. Um, so yeah, fireworks I mean, loud for my ears. I can only imagine <laughs> yeah. for them. Um, okay, Margaret just had a comment uh, that they're restoring marshland in the Hester Marsh and Elkhorn Slough. Hopefully there'll be an expansion of habitat for the otters in the near future. Is that possible? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Sure. Uh, they're restoring marshland in Hester Marsh in Elkhorn Slough, and she's hopeful that there'll be an expansion of habitat for the otters in the near future there. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, maybe. Um, Hester Marsh is being uh, restored with uh, um, sea level rise in mind, and so um, in the future it may provide more habitat for them in the slough. Yeah, for sure. They do use utilize salt marsh habitats, um, the, the back channels of the estuary that are pretty much covered with pickleweed, which you guys I'm sure are familiar with. It's a, a, a wetlands plant that does really well in this um, high salt uh, saline environment and sea otters haul out on the pickleweed. And we, there's areas in Elkhorn Slough where no kayak traffic is allowed and they utilize those areas pretty heavily and those are back channels and a lot more hauling out um, coming out out of the water and onto the shore in those areas where they feel more comfortable that they're safe from disturbance. Great well that answers all the questions that we got tonight. Uh, we have lots of gratitude from our watchers today in the comments so Heather and Jenna make sure you read some of those. And with that, I think, I think we're good for the evening. Heather, Jenna, do you have any last comments or pushes for Sea Otter Savvy? Um, my main push is photos. <laughs> so this is, <laughs> I'm just going to say it one more time. I'm trying to change the mind of every person. And I'm sorry, it's going to ruin Sea Otter photos for you. But just think, when you're enjoying Sea Otter photos, think. What is that otter looking at? <laughs> and, and where did it go you, after? <laughs> if it's the photographer, then they their world has been breached. So just think about that going forward with the photos that you share and promote and like and put up on your your channels. And I would be extremely grateful for that. Don't don't share any videos of sea otters climbing on kayaks, please. <laughs> Definitely that behavior change. I'm going to do another plug. Make sure if you haven't already checked out the We Were Here Sea Otter site, definitely check it out and please share your voice with us. We'd love to hear um, your concerns and perspectives. Thanks. Thanks, Andy Johnson from Defenders I, of Wildlife for helping me with some answers in the chat. I yeah, I was just it. noticing, Andy, I think it's <laughs> the um, offshore wind planning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yes, thanks, Andy. I saw Kathleen from Defenders is also on here. Um, okay, great. Well, 
thanks everyone for joining us tonight. And oh, let's see, hold on. There's so many photo contests, maybe some more good guidelines from you would yeah. help. So we did, um, you might've missed it earlier. I, I think Chanel, did you pop that into the chat? Maybe you can do it one more time. Yeah. We have a photo guidelines page and it's for both photos that you are looking at and photos that you might be taking. And so it has guidelines for, for enjoyers of photos and for photographers. And we have a gallery of photographers that are Seattle savvy and you can look at their, review their materials. Um, inspired by them. Yeah. Yep. Wonderful. Well, this is not the last that you'll see Alaka and Sea Otter Savvy working together. Yes. So, um, thanks so much again for joining us tonight. Always a pleasure. And we'll see you at our, our next chit chat. See you at Sea Otter Awareness Week. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so Sea much. Week. You're Thank welcome. Thank you, Snell, Alaka Lions. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Good night. Bye.